Welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, alongside my co-host, Matt Miller. Every business day, we bring you interviews from CEOs, market pros, and Bloomberg experts, along with essential market-moving news. Find the Bloomberg Markets Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. All right, we need to get the latest uh, reporting uh, from Israel, uh, and obviously a fluid situation. Ethan Bronner joins us. He is the Bureau Chief in Israel for Bloomberg News. He's uh, in Tel Aviv. Ethan, thanks so much for joining us here. Can you give us the latest reporting from the ground in Israel? What's developing right now? Sure. Um, we're still in a, basically a large waiting mode for Israel to begin the next part of its um, Massive operation still has 300,000 guys in uniform. They've kind of they've built a kind of temporary base with infrastructure near Gaza from which they're going to uh, launch operations. Uh, it's almost certain it's a ground operation, but they haven't officially announced it. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Americans have sent a bunch of help because the Israelis say that their uh, material is fairly uh, stretched, both in terms of their ability to. Uh, monitor from the air what uh, what they're hitting, and even basic things like helmets for their uh, soldiers. They say everyone has a helmet, but some of them are old and lousy. And they and there's some protective gear. Uh, some of, by the way, some of the uh, protest movement that was uh, working very hard against the government has now turned itself into a fundraising operation to help troops and families in the south. And they've raised uh, tens of millions of dollars in order to. Um, um, Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, uh, in order to help those in the South and soldiers get protective gear. So um, there is uh, a lot, a lot going on. At the same time as Southern Lebanon, people are afraid that something's going to happen there. They are driving away. Uh, that could be because Hezbollah does decide to come in. Uh, I live in Tel Aviv, and we have had uh, missiles from Gaza hit Tel Aviv three times today. Uh, uh, Hezbollah is also known to have long-range missiles uh, that can reach here. So it's pretty intense. So, Ethan, what does it look like to amass 300,000 soldiers outside of Gaza? I mean, that's a large number of people for it is. an area of land that I'm going to say is roughly the size of you know New York plus Westchester. No, look, it's a good question. I mean, they're not all in one spot, but I mean, there is uh, there because there are people have gone north, there are people have gone to the West Bank, there are people, uh, but 300,000 men are in uniform uh, as reservists. So uh, it's a lot of people. I agree with you. Now, they're obviously going to try to take them into Gaza soon. Uh, because they uh, they feel that they need to strike while the iron is hot, while the world still has in its mind the images of the slaughter on Saturday of kids at a at a rave concert and uh, and uh, families at a kibbutz and so on. So they clearly want to move quickly. One of the things that they've had more trouble with than they expected is was the sort of securing of the south and the uh, and the border fence. Uh, they have largely done that now, but uh, that was so incredibly breached by Hamas fighters on Saturday. Uh, and they now it looks like there were probably close to 2,000 Hamas guys who came in on Saturday. They'd been saying 1,000, but today they said that they found 1,500 bodies of Hamas guys, and they've taken a bunch of people prisoner. So it's closer to two than to mm. one. So, Ethan, what is the expectation for the next step for Israel? Are they going to send in tens of thousands or more troops into Gaza? And if so, what would be the objective? So they're not, of course, telling us, uh, and we can only speculate, uh, but the objective seems to be uh, to I mean, put in a large way, the way they're saying it is, it's to send a message and make clear to Hamas that it never again will carry out an attack like it did on Saturday. It will not have the capacity because we're going to take down every ability of theirs to do so. Now, is this really possible? And if you go door to door in this way, aren't you going to lose a lot of guys? It does seem like they're going to lose a lot of guys. It feels like they have decided that they're going in, that there it's an almost existential uh, a, a cause that they think that they have here to send this message not just to Hamas but to the greater, greater region to Hezbollah and to Iran that Israel is willing to lose people and to fight in a, in an ugly way 
to survive. It, it's a very interesting shift that has occurred here because just a week ago, if you like, it was all about making, uh, you know, the new Middle East with Saudi Arabia and railroads and, 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 and optic fibers. And now it's we are we have to send a military message of muscle and that's what we're focused on now it'll i think it's a hell of a gamble uh we shall see where it goes do you think we're gonna have to see this fight broaden out i mean you mentioned hezbollah is lobbing down missiles from um lebanon and of course all of this hamas hezbollah is funded i think to the tune of i heard this morning 93 percent uh, by Iran. From Iran. So, yeah, that's right. you know, I, I suppose you can have an academic um, debate about whether or not Iran knew every single detail of this plan and Green stamped it at every step of the way. But it doesn't really matter if right. they're the ones who are funding everything. Don't you need to take the fight to them? Well, I mean, I don't think that they want to take the fight to them, right? I mean, in, in, in the, 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 that, that would be a really a kind of regional conflagration that is almost unimaginable, both in terms of supplies of oil and everything to the world and the, and the number of people involved. So, in fact, the U.S. has sent this big fleet, right, to the Eastern Med. It's on its way to send a message to Hezbollah to say, don't send any, any, any missiles down and to send a message to Iran to say, we're going to limit it to this. So uh, I don't. And Iran, meanwhile, is sending messages saying, "If you guys go and and start killing people in Gaza, you should know that you're going to pay a price." We don't know what that means, but it may mean something. So I don't think the goal here is to bring it to a broader uh, uh, front, but it may happen anyway. I'm not sure how well thought out this all is. I do know there is an incredible sense of fury and humiliation in Israel, and uh, I'm not sure that makes for the best laid plans. It's definitely scary. I yeah. Mean, we're, it's an I, I, I wonder what the mood is like on the ground, Ethan. I mean, you're, you know— covering this i imagine in a professional sense um every waking moment of your life right now but uh when you stop and reflect personally or when you look around at at the you know human costs i mean how terrifying is it it's terrifying it's utterly terrifying and uh and i'm you know i'm, I'm not an israeli and uh, so i don't have that same sense that they have but i have been amazed uh, since Saturday morning at the complete shift turning on a dime of people I know here who all they cared about before was stopping the judicial overhaul and trying to drive Benjamin Netanyahu from office. And now all they want to do is go in and be hard asses in Gaza. Mm. They, it's just they, they, they want to go in and they want to fight back. They've, there's a, almost like a genetic impact here on, on, on Jewish DNA in Israel, that what they saw happen on Saturday reminded them of the Holocaust, reminded them of pogroms, reminded them of things that they uh, decided to build this state to stop from happening. And that sense of deep uh, fury and cause and purpose is everywhere right now. I know it won't last, but it is everywhere right now. And when you see also videos of the soldiers gathered near Gaza, they are pumped up uh, and they they are ready to go in. So, Ethan, how are, how are the, the folks? Uh, so you're in Tel Aviv now. Do you have family there as well? Uh, I, I, I have cousins. I do have a wife. Uh, I don't have children here. Yep. It's My just, kids are in New York. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see because it just, uh, it's, it's such a difficult situation there on the ground. They're very so, difficult. And everybody's got kids, cousins, yep. brothers, husbands, and who uh, are now in uniform. So, uh, and a lot of people know people who died uh, on Saturday as yep. well. All right, Ethan, thank you so much. We really appreciate getting uh, some time with you. Ethan Bronner, he is the bureau chief of uh, Bloomberg News uh, in Tel Aviv, Israeli bureau chief. Appreciate getting a few minutes of his time. We understand. I'll tell you what, uh, we don't, what you know, we haven't, and uh, we, we don't, I guess, on radio or television, go into the horrendous crimes that were committed mm -hmm. over the weekend. I mean, he, Ethan mentioned the, um, the, the mass murders at the yep, music yep. festival. Yep. And when you read some of the reporting about that, it's just so bad that I, it's hard even to talk about publicly. No, and that's why I And think I can't imagine how human beings would do that. No. Um, you know, maybe someone who, a sick individual, but how no. would a group of humans do that to a, yep. another group? And that's why getting Ethan's on the ground reporting was fantastic to get a sense of kind of what he's seeing 
uh, with the people on the street and how committed they are to, uh, you know, going in and, and kind of react and re retaliating. So, again, probably some more uh, difficult news before it gets better over there. But we will obviously have full reporting going forward. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's bring in Ira Jersey here. He's the chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, we're going to get some inflation data over the next couple of days. And I think most people feel like it's going to show continued moderation in inflation, both at the producer level and at the consumer level. If I'm the Fed, is that enough to kind of say, all right, I can just sit on my hands for a while and see how things play out? Is that kind of how it should be? Well, assuming we do continue to get moderation, I think that there's a risk that some of the moves that we saw last month in, uh, in oil prices are going to maybe lift the headline numbers a little bit, particularly in the consumer price data. But uh, it, it's really the key, I think, will be the core inflation data. So what is core, core CPI? Does that continue to moderate? And assuming it does, then, then it probably gives some cover for the Federal Reserve to, um, to, to not hike again in, in November. Um, I still think that, that you know, the, there's less than 50-50 chance that they actually do at this point. And I think things like you know, global geopolitical tensions increasing certainly is something else that will weigh on whether or not they're going to hike interest rates again. Um, so so you know, I would argue that, that yes, this data that we're getting this week is critical. Um, but it's, there's a lot of other moving pieces, obviously, to the, to the mathematics of another hike or not. One of those moving pieces, I guess, is real rates. And it, in a sense, it reminds me of uh, Mike McGlone always says higher prices are the best cure for higher yep. prices. <laughs> exactly. Um, it, it, I guess it's the opposite in the bond world, right? If these prices fall to a low enough point, everyone's going to come in and start buying them. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think for, for rates, um, you know, th there is a level where, um, where bond yields are attractive. And, and certainly when you look at things like tips yields, 2.5%, um, you know, a little bit less than 2.5% for 10-year uh, tips yields, you know, th that I think is pretty attractive to some people. But then when you go back and you look at the historical context, where were those types of yields in the late 1990s when tips, tips started to trade and then before the global financial crisis, you still had tips yields that were, were 3% or above. So, so, so I think from when people look at these charts, it's only relative to the last 10 or 15 years that, um, that real yields are, are particularly high. Um, so, so I do think that, though, that, you know, they're not, a, they're not unattractive at these levels would be, my, would be what I would say. And, and now they're a much more interesting inflation hedge than they were when tips yields were negative, right? When tips yields were negative 100 basis points, that meant in order to, you know, just to break even, you'd have to have inflation of at least 100 basis points. But, you know, for a bond investor, you want to have a return above inflation. And, you know, we're finally at a level where I think people could be comfortable that we're um, reasonably enough above inflation in, in terms of, of the yield that you get that, that you can continue to see some, some nipping at the, at the uh, edges there, especially if the Federal Reserve is going to be done hiking rates. Well, as you well know, Ira, it's, it's world known here that I've taken recession off the table. And I think the yield curve is kind of supporting me here. I'm looking at the inversion, inversion of the yield curve. It's only negative 30 basis points today. And back in July, it was, you know, north of 100. So what's that tell you? <laughs> yeah, so, so, so it's not a surprise to me that we've, we've become less inverted. Uh, it's the way that we become less inverted that was a little bit surprising to me. So, you know, our, our view had been that as the Federal Reserve winds down its hiking cycle, that we'd see a, a two-year yield start to uh, come down versus 10-year yields basically staying the same. And we've gotten just the opposite of that. And I think that that's a reflection and a major reflection, not so much of that the Fed's going to be done, because the Fed, even if it hikes again, is probably done uh, after one more hike, it's more how long do they keep rates at this at this level? And if you're right, Paul, and we don't get a recession, which is is more or less uh, the, the view that that we take here at, at Bloomberg Intelligence Rates uh, Strategy, is um, the, the the yield can wind up uh, you know basically pancaking. So we're calling it a a pancake of a yield curve where you can have two-year yields, five-year yields, ten-year yields, basically at the same-ish level. 
um, and wind up maintaining that for, uh, for the next six to nine months. And then you probably start to see you know, calls for a cut, people worry about growth in 2025 and the like, because the longer the Fed holds rates high, the deeper a recession that the market's going to price. So I do think that eventually it's going to be time to get into what we call bulk steepening, which is buy two-year notes, keep 10-year notes kind of market weight or underweight, and then you wind up seeing a pretty significant uh, steepening of the yield curve. Um, what would, do you think, cause the Fed to cut rates? Are we talking about unemployment breaching a certain level, 4.5%, for example? Is it about the speed rather than the level? Um, you know, if it jumps up all of a sudden to over four, or uh, is it about you know GDP slowdown? What, what do you think? Yeah, so if there's some kind of exogenous shock that causes mass layoffs, then certainly the Federal Reserve would take notice. Um, but remember, I, I do think that at, in this environment, and and given how uh, difficult it has been for the Federal Reserve to, to, to kind of get inflation expectations and maintain inflation expectations um, to be relatively low, um, I think that you have to have not only an increase in, um, uh, in the unemployment rate, but you also have to have a, a continued decline of inflation. So in, in a situation where you have the, the PCE deflator running at, at 3% or 3.2% and the unemployment rate rises a little bit over a few months, I think the Fed's still on hold, right? They're still going to be worried about that inflation component of, um, of, of a lot of the data, right? And their mandate, they do have this dual mandate, which sometimes makes it a little tricky for them, right? If, you, if you're the European Central Bank and you only care about inflation, then uh, you, you know, you're, you're, it's a little bit easier to kind of manage your, your rate and rate expectations. So, um, so, so I do think it, it has to be the unemployment rate rising very quickly, but only in an environment where uh, inflation is, is moderate, continuing to moderate. Ira, when you talk to your institutional investor clients, the folks you've been talking to for years, what's the trade they're talking about most uh, these days? Yeah, so so it was a couple of a couple of weeks ago the idea of being long duration because typically um, typically the longer end of the yield curve does pretty well when the Fed uh, when the Fed stops its hiking cycles um, and I think a lot of people were the wrong way so so people are, are a little bit nervous and and you know don't want to take big positions right now because there's a lot of uncertainty and and the direction not so much of monetary policy but more in terms of positioning in the market uh, what the supply story is going to be because in, uh, deficits continue to be uh, run pretty high so people are worried that there's there's been a supply shock a little bit although that's uh, our data and our work suggests that that's not as much the case um, but nonetheless I think there's a lot of people out there who got burned and um, would just rather you know stay market weight or just sit on their hands and not do a lot yet until there's uh, you know a more significant um, uh, or it becomes much clearer what the direction of the economy and monetary policy is going to be. Hey, Ira, how's liquidity in the marketplace? If I if I call up my, you know, the Govy desk at, you know, J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, can they make me a nice deep market? Uh, they haven't been able to recently. So the liquidity has been pretty poor really in the last 18 months. And I think a big part of that is just because the market's gotten so big and the pipes that all of this money and all these bonds have to flow through is it has basically remained the same size. So you have a lot more flow and a lot more supply out there that needs to find a home. And on the other side, you know, you don't have dealers that are willing to take on the the size and warehouse risk the way that they were um, you know, prior to the global financial crisis, prior to the Basel, new Basel regulations that, that kind of constrain the way that dealers can operate. So, uh, so, so, so part of the reason why we've seen a lot of the volatility in the market has been a little bit of liquidity. You know, mm -hmm. that being said, like top line, like if you want to do, you know, social, what I call social size, you can probably get it done. But if you want to do a bigger trade, it's going to be more difficult to get off. So people are going to add leg into these trades, which just means that you might have um, you know, uh, longer periods of time that you have to shift your risk around. So what, another reason why you might just want to sit on your hands for a little while. What about the auctions and especially um, any longer dated treasury auctions? How much do dealers, primary dealers take down now? And, you know, who's the rest? So dealers actually have been taking down historically a tiny amounts. So in a lot of uh, in a lot of treasury auctions, dealers used to used to take a bulk of auctions. You know, 40 percent, thirty percent. Now in a many uh, many auctions, they take less than ten. 
Um, and it's really the demand from uh, domestic asset managers and foreigners that wind up being the mix of, uh, of buyers of these, of these auctions. There is higher savings now than there was, say, 15 years ago uh, in the United States when we had a significant amount of disk savings. So some of the money ends up going back into, um, into, into various, uh, you know, we call it yep. savings vehicles, whether those are insurance funds or, or even baby boomers, you know, shifting money out of equities and into fixed income mutual funds or ETFs. Um, all of those flows to combined meant that asset managers have been, right. you know, by far the largest buyer at auction. All right, Ira, thanks so much uh, for joining us. As always, Ira Jersey, Chief U.S. Interest Rate Strategist for uh, Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, joining us from uh, Princeton. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Matt Miller, Paul Sweeney, live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Uh, looking at Pepsi, they reported some results uh, a little bit better than expected. Let's break it down. We can do that with Ken Shea. He's a senior analyst, uh, covers beverages, tobaccos, and cannabis uh, with Bloomberg Intelligence. So we're going to break that down. Ken, thanks so much for joining us here. Talk to us about Pepsi. How did our friends there in Purchase New York do? Yeah, hi, Paul. They did really, really well. Um, you know, as is PepsiCo style. It was a report that exceeded expectations as they normally do. Um, but, um, you know, sales were up uh, at a, a nice, strong, uh, high single digit rate. EPS came in at about 14%, both again, beat expectations. And importantly, the underlying trends were good. Um, it, the gains were broad based, international was really strong, um, which offset a lot of the currency headwinds still. And uh, the company's outlook was also favorable. They, they lifted their uh, outlook for core EPS, adjusted for currency, uh, up a little bit. And they even went out, uh, unusual for them, and looked out to 24. And I didn't give a lot of detail, but they said that, um, you know, their long-term algorithm, which is mid-single-digit revenue and high-single-digit EPS growth, looked like it was going to hit the high end of those ranges. So overall, you had to have a hard time finding a lot of fault with, with these numbers today. What is the what is the, um, the the currency headwind? Is it the fact that the dollar is so strong that the revenues they're bringing in from elsewhere are lower? Yeah, that's right. The um, recent strength of the dollar, uh, you know, versus the pound um, in particular, uh, has been weighing a little bit uh, on their uh, on their reported numbers. Um, you know, that's been going on for quite some time now. It may extend a little bit further. Um, but again, I, I think the underlying fundamentals of the business are, are are very favorable. I think that's what investors are looking at. You know, they were also looking at this whole notion of the obesity drugs. You know, I don't mean to uh, jump to probably a question that was coming up, but a lot a lot of uh, investors were nervous about the talk about obesity drugs. How how's it going to weigh on the snack and confection of food companies? They seem to allay those fears and said, look, we there's there's no real evidence of that happening now. And um, you know, I'm looking at you know, the past per capita consumption of uh, salty snacks, and it's been rising at a, you know, low single digit steady rate over the last few years, higher than sweet snacks. So I don't see it uh, really being a, an issue in the near term. I think that's helping uh, the share sentiment today. Well, they have, I mean, they expect <laughs> core earnings per share growth of 13% at cost of currencies. Mm -hmm. That's strong. They, organic revenue growth forecast at 10 percent so that's big and i wonder if the you know we talk obviously a lot on this show about the glp1 drugs the obesity drugs and their effect on um consumer discretionary stocks and you know after news like what we saw at walmart last week where they said people who get these drugs have a smaller calorie uh basket that makes sense on the other hand we also talk about weed a lot ken <laughs> and i'm here to tell you that uh the wait isn't that good craving, for the munchies the craving for salty snacks and sugary <laughs> drinks probably i'm guessing rises if you're using Carlation. marijuana products so i guess these things are kind of running at cross currents aren't they you know that's <clears throat> i agree matt and, that, and that's a, a, a potential a trend line that they don't point out but uh, it's probably there you know other long-term secular gains to their favor 
you know, are when you think about a company as global as they are, you know, it's the urbanization of, you know, consumers, you know, they're, they have access to you know, more access to convenience stores where a lot of these things are sold. Um, rising middle class and wealth, they can buy these value added products. Uh, and then consumers today, at least that I do anyway, I, you know, I graze throughout the day. Every time I go, you know, buy the kitchen, I'll, I'll grab something, uh, you know, a snack or something. And that's how people eat today. The, the traditional three meals uh, are kind of going out uh, with the dinosaur. And so this play, all those play really well at a PepsiCo's business model. All right. So PepsiCo, um, the dividend, they've got a little more than a 3% dividend. Uh, they've got a lot of cash on the balance sheet. They throw off a lot of free cash flow. What's the dividend story? What's the cash return story for Pepsi? Yeah, so PepsiCo is very uh, uh, balanced when it comes to their capital allocation. <clears throat> their long-term capital allocation uh, prioritizes dividends. Uh, you know, a select on a selected basis, they'll buy some shares back. Um, and their, you know, their algorithm is you know, with sales um, growing a mid single digit, and EPS growing high single digit, low double digit, they believe that even, you know, at a current PE, they can kind of churn out kind of a low double digit total return uh, for investors. And that's kind of what they've been doing. And, um, you know, if, if the, if the uh, algorithm's working, why, why break it, right? So this is what they've been saying for a long time. You know, and, and the company pointed out today, their stability, you know, you look back five, 10 years, there's a lot of been a lot of macro shock events, you know, pandemics, Earnings, uh, econ economic expansions, uh, slowdowns, uh, you know, disruptions in Europe, whatever, and they keep saying the same long-term algorithm, and they've beaten revenue expectations over the last five years 100% of the time, earnings expectations 95% of the time. Uh, so the company pointed that out, saying, you know, there's a lot of questions about these these uh, obesity drugs and so on. You know, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing, and we have a pretty good track record in meeting and beating. Our, our guidance. By the way, um, I must drink five to 10 cans of flavored seltzer water every okay. day. Every I, day. I, I mean, it's, nice. it's huge, I think, in this country. Maybe it's just this area because the polar um, seltzer water, you know, they're based in Worcester, Mass, mm -hmm. these, the polar beverages. But I've noticed other countries don't have this yet. The no calorie, no sugar, um, basically just seltzer water with a hint of flavor. Is that a growing trend? Oh, sure it is, Matt. Um, PepsiCo does, you know, for, I wish PepsiCo would spend a little more time on its on its international markets. Uh, you know, it, they're performing really well. And, you know, it's a smaller uh, portfolio of their food, snack, uh, and beverage portfolios outside the U.S., but that certainly is, you know, I wrote a recent uh, report on uh, Bloomberg Intelligence about the enhanced water market and uh, how it's really stepping forward to be a really strong growth area for these companies. It hasn't gone unnoticed. It's just that they don't talk about it a lot. I mean, they come out with Gatorade uh, water right now, which is basically, uh, you know, a, a product that um, fits into lifestyles with uh, alkaline water and low calories. Now, this no is the calories, functional, the say. functional water. Yeah, it's a yeah, yeah. functional water. That, that's right. Thank yeah. you. And um it's a really great uh, market. I mean, it, it hits on so many consumer attributes and where they're going right now. Uh, it gives them a great runway for growth. All right, Ken, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Ken Shea, Senior Equity Analyst, Bloomberg Intelligence, follows all the beverage companies, the tobacco companies, the cannabis uh, companies as well. So look I'm going to write him. I'm going to write him a message right now. I need, I need, I need uh, Ken to help me out with questions okay. for the Pepsi CFO. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned I don't know if I mentioned that I'm interviewing the CFO oh, of Pepsi at 1.40 p.m. today on Bloomberg Television. Okay. So yeah. you need some good questions that, to ask to sound smart, right? Yeah. To talk to me. Exactly. I get, I get yeah, what yeah. you're doing. Okay. Pepsi, uh, good numbers uh, today. Have the pricing power. That's for sure. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get back to uh, the geopolitics, uh, Israel, uh, and what it means for the region, the greater Middle East region. Uh, we want to go to Sam Dagger. He's a reporter covering Saudi Arabia for Bloomberg News. He is um, uh, located in Dubai right now. Sam, can you talk to us about kind of we're just a few days into what's been uh, developing in Israel. 
it, give us your sense of what you're hearing, what your sources are telling you about some of the, the ramifications for the greater Middle East region. Absolutely, great to be with you. I mean, obviously, the, the, the one thing in terms of ramifications that people, everybody's talking about is what does this do to efforts, U.S.-led efforts, to get uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel to uh, normalize their relations? I mean, obviously, the U.S. has put a lot of effort into this. The Biden administration had come out openly and, 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 and said it was optimistic, and there were certain things that they needed to... Uh, work out with the Saudis and with the Israelis as well, and, and things were progressing. And we had uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman just three weeks ago saying that uh, progress was, was being made every day and that the, we, were, we were getting closer uh, to a deal. And then this, that kind of puts the freeze on, on, on everything at the time being. Sam, we, you know, especially being in New York, um, I think, here for the most part one side of this story um so many people here obviously have very close connections to israel have family members that live in israel um and of course the you know atrocities committed by the terrorists over the weekend um aren't a great way for them to for you know w for them to tell their story but there are two sides to this thing right so being there do you hear uh a, a lot from the palestinian side well, I, I mean, I'm in Dubai. I'm mainly hearing from um, people in the region. I mean, Saudis, Emiratis, uh, people in the Gulf, who are uh, coming out. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying all of them, but there are people in this region, including many Saudis, who are coming out in support of of Hamas and saying, you know, this is long overdue. I mean, I'm just quoting them now, saying this is in response to all of the atrocities, and again, this is them speaking, uh, uh, that Israel has been committing against them and uh, and that this is uh, a, a, in response to all of that, all the uh, uh, injustices. Uh, again, I'm just quoting them, that the Palestinians uh, have been subjected to. And so you have people in this part of the world who are looking at it differently. Sam, what role do you think Saudi Arabia <clears throat> would like to play in this or if any, or do they, do you think they prefer to just kind of stay on the sidelines here? No, I mean, definitely. I think they want to play a role in terms of, of, of just ending this. And uh, they came out today and said this and, and they said, uh, uh, I mean, the, the crown prince uh, spoke, uh, Mohammed bin Salman spoke today with the uh, president of the Palestinian authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. He spoke, uh, to uh, the Jordanian king and the Egyptian president, and then his foreign minister spoke to his counterpart in the U.S., Antony Blinken. So they're quite active, and they're saying this must must not spread beyond uh, beyond Gaza. And the problem is, we're hearing reports that missiles are uh, being lobbed out of Lebanon. Um, obviously, the West Bank could be a, a, a real problem area, although for now it seems, uh, at least from the reports I've read, that um, most of the threats are coming out of Gaza. How do you think things may change once Israel sends its troops into the Gaza Strip? Uh, they will change a great deal. I mean, obviously it depends on the scale of the Israeli operation. And, and once we um, unfortunately, start start to see the carnage that may be associated with this type of operation. I mean, the, again, depending on on, on 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 the scale of the operation, then obviously things are are going to change. Um, uh, there, there are concerns also. I mean, you named uh, Le uh, Lebanon, West Bank, other places, uh, Syria. I mean, we we haven't reported this ourselves, but we've seen reports of of. Uh, of, of Iranian uh, proxies moving from certain parts of the Syria of, of Syria closer to uh, uh, the border with Israel. Are, are Jordan and Egyptian? Um, are there no threats from those two neighbors? In terms of direct threats to Israel? Yes. I mean, not, not that we know of, but in terms of the sentiment on the street, obviously, most people in those countries are with the Palestinians. Yeah, I'm just trying to round up the region. You look at the map the, the and you see uh, it's such a tightly knit sure. area. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder if all the work that's been done to get um, the Saudis on 
you know, on the same page as the Israelis, it will be undone if there's a massive attack. I mean, if there's a, a massive response here, Sam, does it look like um, that any kind of reconciliation with Saudi Arabia is off the table then? I, I don't think we should jump to that conclusion right away. I mean, as, as our my story today points out, I mean, obviously, this is a blow to the Saudi vision for the region. I mean, the, the Saudi vision, uh, I mean, it's not only they, they have uh, they don't just they don't just have a vision for Saudi Arabia, the vision 2030. They have a vision for the entire region, which says, you know, shared economic uh, uh, benefits and prosperity it should take precedence over uh, wars and ideological differences. I mean, things that the this part of the world has been mired in for decades. That's their vision. And they're saying we want to work with everyone. And you, and you saw the concrete steps that they've taken since the beginning of the year. They, they've uh, reached a detente with Iran that was brokered by the Chinese. Uh, they are negotiating directly with the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. Uh, this is a country where they've been involved in war for eight years. Uh, they've, they've made overtures to Bashar al-Assad, who was backed by the Iranians. So they, they're doing everything to tamp down tensions. That's their vision. Their vision is uh, development, prosperity. Juxtapose the Iranian vision, which is armed resistance, you know, uh, quote unquote, the annihilation of Israel, which is what the Supreme Leader said. I mean, that's the vision of Iran. So you've got two competing visions. Obviously, the Saudi vision has been dealt a blow, but I wouldn't be jumping to conclusions, you know, right away and say it's completely off the table. Uh, yes, Tim, you, you raised the the issue of Iran, and that's clearly for a lot of observers one of the big, big wild cards here. What role do you think Saudi Arabia and maybe some of the Gulf neighbors there can have uh, as it relates to, I guess, just mediating with Iran or just dealing with Iran or communicating with, with Iran? How do you see that playing out? I mean, potentially, but I mean, the one country that has the most contact with the Iranians at the moment is Qatar. I mean, it mediated the U.S. hostage release, if you remember. Uh, so they're the countries in, in the best position to be involved in any way. And obviously, I mean, the Emiratis and, and, and the Saudis of late have, uh, you know, contacts now with the Iranians. Maybe they'll play a role too, but it's it's too early to, 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 to see if that's going to happen. All right. Thanks very much. Really appreciate getting uh, your thoughts there. Uh, Sam Dagger, uh, Dagger, he's a reporter in um, Dubai um, talking with uh, us about the greater, I think, Middle Eastern Gulf issue as this unfolds. In You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Matt Miller, Paul Sweeney, live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. One of the big moves yesterday in response to the uh, news coming out of Israel over the weekend is uh, crude oil. Uh, we had WTI crude oil, Brent crude oil up about 4 to 5% yesterday. Both of those are pulling back about 1% today, so a little bit of a, a, a more stability coming into that market. But we want to get a sense of kind of what the war in Israel means for the global energy space. And for that, we turn to Fernando Valle. He is the senior analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence covering global energy. So, Fernando, let's start with Chevron. Talk to us about what's happening in there, because I know they have a field in Israel uh, that – I believe the Israeli government has uh, asked them or ordered them to shut down. So let's talk first about Chevron. Yeah, absolutely. They have uh, the Tamar and the Le Leviathan fields. They're natural gas fields offshore in Israel uh, that produce uh, around 55 to 60,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day of natural gas that's then shipped to Israel and sometimes uh, regasified, uh, uh, liquefied and shipped out. Uh, elsewhere, so it's it's a small percentage of their current production. They they intend to grow in the region, but obviously this disruption uh, may cause some slows down and some second thoughts around there. Uh, but it's not a significant short term impact for the company itself. But I know, I guess for I'm sorry, just for for Europeans, they were getting some of you know they were obviously lost the supply from Russia last winter. They're getting some of it was coming out of Israel. So is, is that a concern for European buyers? Well, not just Israel, but then the broader uh, scope of it, because they get a lot from Qatar uh, and Qatar shares its gas field, the North field, the largest in the world with Iran. So that is a significant concern uh, if there is an escalation and if Iran is involved in how we get nat uh, liquefied natural gas from Qatar over to Western Europe. 
What's up with that giant natural gas field in Holland that they've decided not to use? Are they still using that? Uh, Groningen is, uh, is going to be shuttered this year. Uh, so no, uh, because of the earthquakes and other uh, and global warming concerns in, in Holland, uh, they are decommissioning that field. It has been underproducing. They had extended the life for a little bit, but they will decommission Groningen. All right. So, Fernando, I, I think the expectation is that this conflict in Israel is going to intensify, maybe expand in scope a little bit. Give us a sense of kind of what the global oil markets are, are telling you over the last couple of days. Well, the, the bounce back yesterday is really around reinforcing the, the Iran sanctions and the likelihood of a deal uh, with the U.S. being off the table after the attacks. Uh, I'll, I'll caveat that uh, Iran has been able to export a lot of its crude uh, through the shadow tanker uh, market. Um, the official numbers show a huge decrease, but we know uh, that some of those volumes had made its way to countries that don't observe the sanctions as tightly. Um, this obviously lowers their overall revenues for the country because as you limit the amount of buyers, uh, it becomes more difficult for them to get a full price for their barrels, um, especially because China, the largest oil importer in the world, um, has said they're done uh, issuing import quotas in 2023. So that creates a significant logjam in those countries, especially after Saudi Arabia had just raised prices in uh, to Asia. So All right. So, oh, in, so, so when we see oil coming uh, back up to eighty-five dollars a barrel, from you know it had dropped to eighty-two, but not nearly reaching the ninety-five dollars a barrel last week, doesn't that signify that people just aren't very worried right now? Well, I, I think it signifies that people are very worried about demand uh, and not so much about supply. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and that is really has been what Mike McGlone and I have harped on for the remainder of the year and early 2024 is that demand is really going to be in the driver's seat. And all the OPEC plus cuts, uh, they just create spare capacity that could come in to, to satisfy supply in, in relatively short order. Um, what this does is that it, it does create a benefit for U.S. suppliers because there are fewer barrels that are allowed in Western Europe and, and, and countries that abide by sanctions. So the Brent WTI spread we expect will continue to be very tight, but the overall price of oil we think will be governed by demand. What is the expectation this winter for Europe? Will they have enough gas? Will they have enough fuel? Uh, last winter uh, came in much better than expected from that, from that issue. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the million dollar question, it, uh, probably even more millions than that. Um, they, they are at their highest uh, natural gas inventories uh, for seasonally adjusted. They're nearly full. Um, and where they, there is an issue is, as Matt pointed, Groningen's offline, uh, Belgium and Germany decommissioned their nuclear plants. So their overall use of natural gas is likely to increase. Um, the question is, last year we had the warmest winter in 50 years on the, on the Northern Hemisphere. If that's the case, then they're probably fine. If they're not, then that inventory will fall very quickly. It's not a whole season inventory. Uh, it's a buffer. And the other issue is that the diesel side of the equation, it, we are considerably short, both in Western Europe and in, 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 Eastern, uh, in the Eastern U United States and North America. Um, so if we have an inclement uh, winter, even a normal winter, it could really put uh, pressure on those inventories. And then you add the, the wrinkle of uh, the Strait of Hormuz, the, 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 the one shipping lane for Qatari uh, natural gas. Uh, if that's shuttered, then it's a really big wrinkle. How far out uh, do people in your industry try and forecast the weather? I'm just interested because you mentioned last winter was unseasonably warm, and that's true. Um, can you look at this winter already and tell what it's going to be like with any kind of certainty? Well, we try to forecast five years out, and we are successful about two weeks out, maybe, sometimes <laughs> less than that. Um, it, it's very hard to forecast weather. I mean, I'm not a meteorologist, but it, it, it's clearly very hard, My, as you can tell from your weather app on your phone. Fernando, what's the what's the call in the energy space these days about China, both as a su source of supply and, and more importantly, demand? 
Well, as a source of supply, they've been on the decline since uh, 2015, 2016, because their, their fields are relatively high cost to continue production. So they haven't really invested in growing the supply uh, to the level required to, to, to recover the post-2015 levels. Um, on the demand side, again, our fear has been around the real estate uh, environment and even with stimuli uh, that's been promised by Beijing, uh, the Chinese consumer is in a fairly dire spot. You know, if we look at how many, the average wage necessary to buy an apartment in Beijing or Shanghai, it dwarfs New York and London, which are, as we know, <laughs> unaffordable. Um, and 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 so much of the provincial government, uh, obviously the real estate uh, market, and then the provincial banks uh, relied on land sales and development for their revenues. And with that drying up, it creates a huge headwind for the country as a whole. Everyone looks at China as having a fairly low debt to GDP ratio, but that's without accounting for all the provincial governments, all the provincial banks that ultimately rely on, on those governments. So once you consolidate that, their level of debt is is fairly elevated and uh, they'll need to rectify, rectify that in order to return to the to growth. And I'll, I'll mention that Exxon gave their guidance for uh, the, the third quarter and petrochemicals, very linked to um, to construction, were down massively. I mean, they were less than half of the second quarter uh, results. All right, Fernando, thanks so much uh, for joining us. As always, appreciate getting your global view on the energy space. Fernando Valley, Senior Analyst, Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, and Matt, just stay on the global energy play. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I'm Matt Miller. I'm on Twitter at MattMiller1973. And I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at PT Sweeney. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide at Bloomberg Radio.